Well, thanks everyone. Uh, working? They're good? Great. Um, so this is defensive rewriting, um, and I'm going to be introducing a, a concept I like to call the alternative resource locator. Um, so the kind of attacks we're going to be talking about today are the, the really the client-based type of web app attacks. So like what's getting all the attention these days? Not the, not the SQL injections where you can just basically sit down at a browser and, and attack yourself, but uh, ones where you're luring other people to, to kind of do your dirty work for you. Um, so this would be cross-site scripting, obviously, um, a very popular attack, the OS number one attack. Um, things like cross-site request forgery, also another uh, very, very popular attack these days. And um, open redirect phishing would also fall under this umbrella. Open redirect phishing is maybe a little more obscure than the other two. Um, this happens when you have, uh, let's say, a server that will accept a parameter from a user and then redirect to whatever, whatever value, redirect the user to whatever value is specified in that. So uh, one example of this, you, you often see this in login pages. So let's say I go to page foo on site.com, but that site requires authentication. I haven't logged in yet. So it redirects me to login, and then once I've authenticated, it redirects me back to page foo. Well, if it's keeping that, that information that I originally came from page foo in maybe like a query string parameter, that can be subject to tampering. So I can, I, can, I can tamper with that parameter, and then once you're done logging in, I can send you not to a different site on site.com, but maybe I'll send you to evil.com under my control. And this really helps with, with phishing attacks, um, especially if you use, uh, if, if you were in the last session here with uh, Chris Weber's Unicode attack, a lot of the stuff that he was talking about with the homograph attacks, that could be absolutely devastating. Um, and also what would fall under kind of a similar, similar umbrella is browser history theft. Now there's, there's lots of ways to steal browser history. You can use script for this or cascading style sheets. Um, I've also heard of iframe timing attacks. And basically what this does is this takes advantage of the fact that hyperlinks rendered in a browser are different depending on whether you've ever been there or not. So you can use, you can use script or style sheets to basically go through a list. You can't just say, show me every place the user's been, but you can ask yes or no questions on individual sites. So you can say, has the user ever been to www.verylargebank.com? And if so, you know they're likely a customer of that bank and you can focus your attacks accordingly. You can't see everything they've searched for, but you can see if they've made specific search queries for Scarlett Johansson or whatever. And current state of the art on this is, is on the order of a few thousand, maybe it could be getting close to 10,000 a second. You don't even have to make a request to the server. So it's, it's a really kind of nasty attack. And for all of these, we, we prescribe vastly different mitigations. So I work on the, on the SDL team at Microsoft, and these are, these are our SDL requirements for defending against these attacks that we make all our internal developers do. So for cross-site request forgery, we say, well, we want you to apply and then validate a, a shared secret, a canary token. Or we want you to use a double submit cookie. Or we want you to, to provide an HMAC on your requests. For cross-site scripting, we say you have to validate your input. Now, I know we say you have to validate your input for basically everything, but you know, that's, that's part of what we say against cross-site scripting. Um, we have to sanitize input. So if there's any kind of malicious input on that, we, we strip it out. We encode output so that every, if there's any type of malicious script, it just gets rendered as harmless text. And actually we have, we have a library called the anti-XSS library to do this. For redirect phishing, we say, oh, we'll just, just supply a whitelist of known good domains, and if you're trying to redirect outside that whitelist, then block the, the redirect. And then I didn't, even, I didn't even put it on the slide, but for, but for history theft, we basically say just like, to the user, clear your cache, which is, which is horrible. Um, now all of these are, vastly different mitigations, which is really, really interesting to me because all of these are exploited exactly the same way. They're exploited through URLs. So I, I, have, I have just a couple examples of here. I have, I have a, a cross-site request forgery attack, a cross-site scripting attack, and a redirect phishing attack. Um, and you know, maybe, maybe, I ha maybe I social engineer this. Maybe I send you an email and it says, you know, click this link to, to get your free Xbox 360. And you, and you click it, and then you get owned. Or maybe I, maybe I embed this in one of the other pages that you go to. Maybe I put it as like the source attribute of, a, of an image tag, or the source attribute of a script tag. Or, you know, there's, there's probably, there's at least dozens, if not hundreds of ways to make a browser make 
a silent get request with your credentials. And, and URL shorteners make this even worse, right? So we have, we have the bitlies and tiny URLs of the world. And, and if you could ever tell where you were going before, which you couldn't, now, now, it's, now it's even more impossible, right? Like what, just, just as an example, um, some, of my, some of my coworkers in, in Inferno sitting here have, have tweeted about this talk. And of course, if you tweet a link, right, it goes to bitly. So I, I love the irony of, of posting bitly links about a cross-site request forgery talk. I just, I found that amusing. Um, so my solution to this is instead of, or let's say in addition to, uh, all, these, all these vastly different mitigations, we can solve the problem, or mitigate, like, we can't solve it. We can mitigate it to a large extent by moving away from a uniform resource locator, something that works for everyone, and instead going to a concept of a personalized resource locator, a URL that only works for you. So if you were to do this, if an attacker were to come up and create a malicious link, the only person in the whole world that that link would affect would be the attacker. Why would you go to the, all the trouble of making an attack if the only person you can own is yourself? And the best part about this is we can apply this retroactively to existing sites with no code changes. And the mechanism we're going to do that with is URL rewriting. So in brief, uh, just a little bit of background, what URL rewriting is usually used for is for cookie-less sessions. So you have to, you have to transmit your a session ID back and forth on every request uh, to the server. And normally that's, normally that's transmitted in a cookie. But not every user is willing to accept cookies, not every browser some, some really old ones, I guess, wouldn't, wouldn't be able to. So in cases like this, like ASP.NET has this functionality built in, where if it detects that your browser is unable or unwilling to accept a cookie, instead of passing the session ID back and forth in the cookie, it just rewrites it into the URL. And normally security guys, and myself included, hate this, um, because it's full of security holes. It, it enables session hijacking attacks. If you're passing your token back and forth essentially in plain text, it's a lot easier for someone to steal that. Even if you're using SSL, you know, there's a good chance this shows up in a log somewhere. It just, it just dramatically increases the attack surface. And even worse than session hijacking, this leads to a session fixation attack. So instead of me trying to steal the session that you've already started, I, as an attacker, I'll just go start my own session. And then if I can get you to start using mine, well, I can just reacquire that at any time because I already know what it is. And I can see what you've done in the meantime. Maybe you've entered some, some personal information that I can harvest. So again, normally, uh, URL rewriting for, for session use is a horrible idea. But that's not what we're going to do here. What we're going to do is we're going to rewrite not the session URL. We're going to keep passing that in the cookie the way we always do. But we're going we're to pass that shared secret. So remember, we, we said that uh, the, the shared secret canary value is one, of the, uh, is one of the SDL defenses against request forgery. So we're going to pick up that exact same mechanism, but instead of passing it in a hidden form field like we usually do, we're going to pass it in the URL. So here's how it works. So I'm a user. I'm going to request site.com slash home, and um, my browser is automatically going to send my session ID, which is Brian. And that's, that's just simplified for, uh, for, for demonstration purposes. Real session IDs would be obviously much more cryptographically secure. And now on the server, the server's going to say, look, you turned on this URL rewriting protection service, and I didn't see any special token come in. You just asked for site.com slash home. So what I need to know is, is this page home protected? Now, we'll get into this a little bit more later, but basically what it is is you have to designate at least one page somewhere on your site as what I call a landing page, or a page that you don't need that token with. Because if your whole site was protected, there'd be no way to make a valid initial request. Now, again, you're going to have to be really careful with the pages you do this with, and, and again, we'll talk about this later. Um, but for our purposes here, we, we say that the page home is a landing page. It is not protected. So the server is going to say, OK, we're OK to proceed. Now the server is going to create and store the secret token. So it's going to say, I'll, I'll create token ABC123. And again, this is vastly simplified. In, in real world, it would be much more cryptographically sound. I'm going to associate that with the session ID Brian and store it in my database, in, in, my, in my server state. Um, at this point, the server will redirect to the rewritten URL. So you ask for site.com slash home, and I'm going to send you a 302 to site.com slash abc123, which was the secret token, slash home. And the browser will automatically uh, oblige. Now the server will, will, now it's got a valid session ID and a token. And it's going to say, we'll do these match. I'm going to, I'm going to look for what the, the token I have stored for Brian, 
And does this match what's passed in? Well, in this case, yeah, yeah, it does. So we're okay to proceed. So it serves the content. Now, in subsequent requests from the user, let's say I say, um, get me page two. So the, it will say, get site.com slash abc123 slash page two. And then we'll basically proceed just like we did from a couple steps ago where the server will validate that the token is, is valid. Now, you may be asking, look, how did you know to automatically go, how did you know to automatically put that abc123 in? Don't we have to, don't we have to reacquire? And the answer is no, because in this case, page two is a relative link off of home. It'll just, the browser will automatically pick up all that, that extra token and the rest of the URL. Now, it won't do this for anything that's absolutely linked off of the page, but that's good. That's what we want. Let's say we have some external content. Let's say on page two, we have a link out to um, microsoft.com slash windows.jpg. Now, if you had, that, that exists. If I absolute URL to microsoft.com slash windows.jpg, that exists and that works. But if I were to try to rewrite a URL or try to rewrite the token into there, microsoft.com slash abc123 slash windows.jpg, that doesn't exist. So this actually works exactly the way you would want it to. Everything you want controlled by the token, you do relatively, and everything externally, you do absolutely. So we've covered the, um, we've covered the good case. Let's cover the evil case. So we have an attacker, and you can tell he's evil because he's glowing red. And he says, Brian, open this URL, site.com slash page two, do something evil. And, you know, maybe he's social engineering me, or maybe he's just tricking my browser into doing it. But for whatever reason, I'll say, sure, sure, I'll do that. Um, so I'll go to site.com slash page two, do evil, and I'll pass my credentials. Now, if we hadn't protected the page at this point, we'd be owned. But the, the page is protected. The server says, well, we don't have a token in that request. Is this a protected page? Yeah, it is. So this is a bad request. I'm going to block it. Now the attacker gets a little smarter. The attacker say, all right, well, I'll go get a valid token. So he starts up his own session, and his token is XYZ789. And then he says, Brian, open this URL, site.com slash XYZ789, page two, do evil. And I'll, I'll do it again. I'll send it with my, with my session ID. And the server's going to say, OK, well, I've got a session ID and a token. Do they match? No, they don't. So I'm going to block this request, too. What we've essentially done in this case is make it so that a poisoned link is useless. The only, the only person that can affect is the attacker himself. I can send this around in an email, and it doesn't matter. I can post it on another page, and it doesn't matter. I can even hide it with a URL shortening service, and it doesn't matter because the victim can't use it. Now, uh, notice we did need to keep session state. We did need to associate the token with the session ID. And while that, that works great for, for most web websites, um, some services won't do this. Like a lot of services won't use uh, session state at all, and it's unlikely that they'd be willing to activate session state for the sole purpose of, of this defense in depth mechanism. Oh, wait, one more thing before we talk about that. Um, history theft, um, in this case, is also completely infeasible. So we talked about uh, using, using um, cascading style sheets to steal the history theft. Now, if we, use, if we said the tokens were ABC123, if we did something a little better than that, like a GUID, in order to check that, uh, you know, if a user had ever been to a, a, to a given page, uh, they'd have to check every individual GUID. So has he been to site.com slash 0000, site.com slash 0001, slash 0002? Now, we said current state of the art is like 10,000 a second. At that rate, it would take more than 100 trillion times the age of the universe to check for a single page. So it's, it's maybe not impossible, but really. <laughs> Um, the, the alternative solution I was getting at, I got a little bit ahead of myself before, that wouldn't require any session state, is a temporary URL, um, different from a personalized URL. In this case, we're not going to require any, any server-side state at all. And what we're going to do, instead of writing a, a canary into the URL, we're going to write a timestamp into the URL. And we're also going to write a keyed hash of that timestamp into the URL. Then when these come back into the server, we're going to check three things. We're going to check that the timestamp is present if it's a protected page and not a landing page. Um, we're going to check that it's valid. So we're going to rekey the incoming timestamp and make sure that that, that or we're going to rehash it and, and see that those hashes match or otherwise it's been tampered with. And then once we know that the, the timestamp is valid, that hasn't been tampered with, we're going to check that it's within a given expiration time limit. And this is controlled by the server too. So you might say every page expires within five minutes 
or whatever. So what this does is effectively create an expiring URL. It works for everybody, but only for a very short amount of time. So your poisoned links, your cross-site scripting attacks, and your cross-site request forgeries aren't really useless anymore. They work, but only for a very, very short amount of time, only five minutes. If you're trying to send these out via like huge fish emails, by the time you get like, I don't know, a, a couple thousand, or maybe you could get like 50,000 or something like that, which is a lot, but it still vastly, vastly reduces the amount of time that anybody has to act on it. And by the time, by the time your potential victim gets back and checks his email, I mean, chances are the, the, the link is useless. And the same if you try to embed it on a page, you do like the script source trick or the image source trick. This is only gonna work for a very short amount of time. Um, now, I, I talked about putting a hash on it and keying it. Um, the reason we do this, uh, to, to A, to prevent tampering, and B, to prevent attackers from creating a valid future attack. So if we didn't do this, we could just say, um, give me a, a valid timestamp for January 1st at midnight, then January 1st at 12.05, January 1st at 12.10. And I could seed a page with enough so that one of them would eventually work, which is, again, why we don't do this. We, we put a hash on it. In history theft, is, is, still pretty, is still pretty tough. Um, assuming that you have a, a millisecond granularity on that timestamp, in order to pull off an attack like this, the attacker would actually have to make the requests at each millisecond to the server and store the hashes that come back and associate that. So he knows at 12 zero, 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 it's this, it's this hash, at 12 zero, 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 at plus one millisecond, it's this hash, and store that forever, and then when you wanna check whether the user has ever been there, you have to check all those. I mean, you'd be checking and storing millions. And again, it's not, it's not impossible, but realistically, it's, it's, it's extremely infeasible. Um, problem, problem with this is that you can have a third-party accomplice site that can be used to, to bypass the whole thing. Um, so actually, I think I've got it, yeah. Um, so again, the, the, the evil user glowing red uh, just says to me, hey, open this URL, evil.com. So he's just luring me to his evil site, and you know, if, if for whatever reason I agree, um, I'll make the request to evil.com, and you can see it's an evil server, too. Um, now, the, the evil server will make a server-side request, so from server to server, to site.com slash home, which is a landing page. Now, site.com is going to re 302 redirect back with something with a valid timestamp, now the evil server redirects, so I asked for evil.com, but I'm now I'm gonna redirect, redirect you to site.com slash valid timestamp slash page two do evil. Uh, I will oblige with my credentials and I'm owned. So I don't think the temporary URL defense is as good, but we did at least raise the bar a little bit for those who can't accept session state. Um, we, you, you, had to, you basically had to have a server that was under your control um, that may leave some breadcrumbs back to you or back to the attacker. Again, it's not, it's not a perfect defense, but we did, we did raise the bar at least a little bit. Um, and one thing we haven't talked about is that any kind of external or any kind of cross-site scripting will completely defeat everything we've talked about today. So I said, I said watch your landing page, right? If you have a cross-site scripting vulnerability on a landing page, the game is over because the attacker could inject script that would just say, well, I'll, I'll read the valid token and I'll modify the DOM. Or it could, just do, it, could, it could take advantage of that same wonderful relative URL that we took advantage of and just set document location to a relative URL plus the, the malicious script. So you've really got to watch your landing pages. Um, some other extremely unfortunate side effects that people have pointed out, well, you can't email links around anymore. Now, it's kind of by design. We didn't want people emailing malware to us but now our friends can't email good things to us. And you can't bookmark stuff and save it for later because the link will be invalid. Uh, and, and the worst one is that search engines can't index the site anymore. And there are whole industries built around improving your search engine results. And basically we say, if you apply this, you're done. You, you can't, they won't be able to use it. So what I think the, the answer to all of these and really the best usage scenario for this idea is not just, to, not just to apply it to your entire site. Don't just like flip the switch and say, we're gonna use these alternative resource locators. What I'd like to do is apply it to a secure subdomain or a secure separate domain. So let's go back to our very large bank. If we're a very large bank, um, then you know, if I wanna see the branch locations or the hours 
or whatever the current interest rates are. This is all public information, and this should be served off of very large or www.verylargebank.com, and we should not be protecting it with the alternative URLs. But when I log in and I want to check my account balance and I want to, I want to make transfers, well, this should be done out of secure very large bank, and it should be done with SSO. So what I want to see is no landing pages anywhere on secure dot, all your landing pages on www dot, and then when you log in, it goes to secure with the token. And all the, all the problems we said before, you know, search engines can't index it. Well, I don't really want search engines indexing my account balance. You know, and I, I don't really care if I can't bookmark right to my checking account, because I'm going to have to go to my login page first anyway. Um, now, I, I have a, a tool that was released on download.microsoft.com earlier this week. It's also on the CD, um, so you can try to remember this huge URL, or you can just pull it off the URL, or you can go to blogs.msdn.com slash SDL and, and pull it from there. So my, my tool works with um, uh, IS, ASP.NET, and basically you just drop it in as an HTTP module into IS and turn it on and then you mark which pages are landing pages and, and you're protected. Now, I really don't want people using this on a production site. It's a total research tool, uh, but look at it, check it out, um, open it with Reflector, decompile it, do whatever you want, and you know, send, send me feedback. I would love to hear uh, where it works and where it doesn't work. Um, so, I think I'm just about out of time. Um, for conclusion, I think that this can be very useful as a defense and depth mechanism. I'm, I'm not suggesting that we just stop fixing cross-site scripting vulns or cross-site request forgery vulns. I'm definitely not saying that. Um, but I think if we apply these to secure subdomains, it can be a real help as a very effective defense and depth mechanism. Um, I've written this up for MSDN, if you want to check that out there. And again, I've written about it on an SDL blog. I have one more very important thing to say uh, before I end, and that's it's my wife's birthday today, so please give her a hand. <laughs> And uh, that's it. So I'm out of questions, or I'm out of, I'm out of time, but if you have questions, I will be more than happy to, uh, to hear them. Thanks, everyone. Go. Right. Yeah, it should, uh, the login page should definitely be started over SSL, but it, it, it shouldn't be protected with the alternative idea. Yeah, that, that's a great point. I think like once, once you log in, like your next step should be to, uh, to an alternative URL. Thanks. Oh yeah, so, okay, so Inferno is pointing out that the fact that uh, you can leak your secure token through the refer, and that's definitely true. That's, that's definitely a shortcoming of this, and, and thank, thanks for pointing that out, really. Um, I, I guess the best suggestion I can make is, is when you're in your protected zone, to not do that as much as possible, to, to keep it all internal content, or at least something that you, you very strongly trust. Um, but that, that is uh, correctly a, a, a definite weakness of this idea. Okay, I don't think there's anything more. Thanks, everyone.